travel into the future. Uh, I also so I had, I had three or four projects at Conservation Tech uh, where I that came actually a couple came out of Blueprint, the original Blueprint that I then took uh, and, and, and worked at Conservation Tech. Um, the second thing on the top right was uh, my senior thesis. Um, many of you may have an opportunity to take a class, an independent study, uh, an opportunity to, to kind of do a project. What you're doing today may may be applicable to that. And I know many professors are, are, are happy to, to, to kind of take this kind of thing. So just something to think about, you know, extending the life of your project beyond just this weekend. Um, I was also involved in XPRIZE. I know that there's a, a group at Duke doing the Rainforest XPRIZE, very relevant here. Uh, and then also anyone that's not from Duke uh, might also be interesting to think about how your solution may be interesting uh, for that competition. And then finally, there are many labs at universities where uh, either you can bring your project that you're talking about, but also, you know, some of the projects or your technical skills at least could be applicable to those labs. So I was very heavily associated with the Duke University Marine Lab, uh, a couple of labs down there that were focused at the intersection of marine science and engineering. So just 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 kind of laying the groundwork here as to how I got into this space and, and how you all may want to extend uh, what you're doing today and this weekend uh, into the future. So just very quickly, my day job is at Conservation X Labs. Uh, we are a innovation company with our mission is to uh, end the sixth mass extinction, which is human induced and, uh, and is going on right now. So we do this in a couple of ways. The first is open innovation. And this is kind of can, similar to X prize um, where we run prizes and challenges. These prizes and challenges we do something what we call un addressing the underlying drivers of extinction. And that might be something that you all might want to think about today as well. Uh, what this means is that we recognize there are problems in biodiversity loss. There, there are, you know, we've, as, we, as was mentioned in the, in the keynote speakers today, uh, a lot of people are very concerned and it often turns into a, a doom and gloom kind of field. But what we try to do is take a step back. Why is the forest being deforested? Why is there, uh, why is there uh, over harvesting of fish? Those kind of questions. And, and once we can take a step back, why is there climate change? You can start to, to address the, the drivers of those, of those um, problems. And that's where technical solutions really come into their foray. Uh, a lot of conservation is monitoring. Um, and that in some cases addresses those, the, the reasons for the biodiversity loss. But in many cases, you need to do something with that data. You have to do something with that monitoring for it to be useful. So really thinking about what those causes of the biodiversity loss is really important. Just very quickly, some of these challenges we've run, um, just to show how diverse those drivers can be, we've run the Global Cooling Challenge, which is, uh, if anyone's familiar with uh, Project Drawdown, the top causes of climate change ranks in a very kind of numerical, uh, concrete way, the number one driver of climate change is actually uh, the uh, is is uh, is cooling. So being able to refrigerate both houses and or cool houses and you know storage uh, of food along the food supply chain. Now, this challenge was about trying to create a more efficient cooling system. And if that is true, we can lower and we can we can make the metrics, which it looks like some of our competitors will. Uh, we can reduce global emissions and, and the, the heating effect by up to one degree Celsius. Now that's a huge impact for not only the climate, but then also that flows onto the biodiversity crisis we're facing that obviously affects the Amazon and, and the rainforests around the world. Um, and then we've also run challenges in <laughs> things like um, the, this, this one here, it was the Ohia challenge, which is a uh, as an icon iconic uh, species of tree in Hawaii that was facing a uh, extinction from fung a fungal pathogen. So there are many, many opportunities to get involved with, with what we're doing at Conservation X Labs. And again, uh, we're about to, uh, we have these challenges ongoing and, 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 uh, and uh, there's always an opportunity, I think, for people uh, like yourselves to have a look at these challenges and maybe use your technical skill sets or even the project you're, you're working on this, this weekend to apply uh, and, and maybe, you know, <laughs> go somewhere and take it, take it beyond just an idea. 
second part of conservation exercise, which is what I actually work in, is called directed innovation. That's engineering, right? So we actually make stuff. Um, and um, and what we're really trying to do here, again, is where we feel like we can perhaps address these underlying drivers. We'll, we'll take that uh, and, and build a product around it. Uh, we have built, <laughs> just before I get into those products, this is the first, this is the second lesson I've really found is that designing accessible scientific tools is hard, but it's really awesome. Now, um, when we say accessible, and this is really important for everyone, um, if you're designing something, you know, it's not just uh, making it easy to use, so removing those technical barriers, but you have to consider things like language. It's particularly true in conservation. We we don't uh, work in an exclusively English speaking world. It's important to make sure your solution and so your code base, perhaps in, in, in software, has to be able to has to be able to deal with with multiple languages. Those kind of considerations are actually really key and actually often occur very early on in the design process. So just something to consider. And then also to make something accessible, someone actually has to be able to buy it, and that's important to consider. You can make the best fandangled you know tool ever, but if no one can access it because they don't have the funding. Uh, because you've over-designed it in some way, they won't be able to use it, so you won't achieve impact. So just something to consider. So the first of the projects I wor I've worked on at Conservation X Lab is called the, the NABIT. Um, it is the nucleic acid barcode identification tool, bit of a, a bit of a mouthful. I can't share the latest photos of this, but this is going through design for manufacture right now. Uh, but the idea here is that we can say, is the species present in the sample? That species can be anything. It can be uh, uh, an endangered species. It can be uh, something from a scat sample, or it could be some, a virus. And that's actually where a lot of our work has been recently is in actually doing rapid tests for COVID. The idea behind this is that we've designed it to be accessible, low cost, and can be used by anyone. And the reason that's, that's useful is because in the field of conservation, we don't necessarily, we can't necessarily assume that we have the technical ability to be able to operate the systems you might design. So just very important to consider who's going to be using the product, the tool, the software that you're working with. Very important, because otherwise it's just a fancy paperweight that's left on someone's desk somewhere in the world. The third, the third lesson I have learned uh, is that uh, data is only useful if you can use it. We see a lot and lot of data collection um, in, in the field. It, uh, we just had a call, for example, with a, a local DC urban ecology group. They have 1500, uh, 1,500 cameras out taking photos of people walking walking by with their you know legs, but they're trying to understand the urban ecology of, of Washington, DC. Uh, but, oh, sorry. Uh, go away. Uh, sorry. Um, but uh, it's very hard to process the data. And by the time they get around to processing, it means nothing. So it's really important if you're designing a tool that collects data, you also have to consider how it's being used because it's only useful if you can turn around and do something with it. Along those lines, the second project I've been working on is is uh, it's called the Sentinel. And, and what this is all about is kind of allowing AI to be accessible uh, and more widespread within the field of conservation. The core idea behind this product is that it retrofits to any existing collection device. Uh, so a camera trap or an acoustic recorder and kind of turns that, that device into a smart device. It, it basically has two features. It, uh, it, it uh, gets the data off the, off the auxiliary device. So the camera trap or the acoustic recorder processes it using AI and the algorithms and then sends that data back to uh, the cloud. Now, because you've processed that image, you can send only relevant data. The, the users may want the entire picture, but in, in all, and often all they want is what's going on in the field. So we saw a swift fox at this time at this location. They don't need to see all of the false positives. They don't need to see all of the, all of the pretty pictures. They are really, interested in answering a question because that's primarily why you deploy devices to the field. But the one thing to remember here as well is that you're not only designing something like a gizmo, a tool, you have to make it usable to people and provide the interface to make that tool uh, actually useful to them. So we also have things like a management dashboard, 
and then allowing for custom models to be to be made. Because one thing to remember is that if you're doing anything in artificial intelligence, at its core, what you're doing is you're answering a question again and again, right? The problem within conservation in the conservation space is that everyone has a different question. Now you can either go broad and uh, and answer everyone's questions pretty well, and and that's often enough. But in many cases, you you need to answer a very specific question that is to a very specific customer. So that's also something to consider that in conservation, the space is so specific to the to the study area that you are talking about. And that often means that technology kind of gets tripped up trying to be either accessible to or, or broadly applicable or only applicable to one to one specific area. Another thing <laughs> that I've learned is that, and this is something that's also super relevant to, to all of you, being, uh, being that you're uh, often all in college, is that it's possible to learn new technical skills if you have to. I was a mechanical engineer in college. I did not do any software. I did so, you know, I've already spoken about AI, but I also didn't do any hardware design, so printed circuit boards. Um, this is something you can learn if you have to. Often there are uh, other people that do it better, but in, con in the field of conservation, often there, there may not be the funding to hire someone. And so if you have to learn something to do, do what you have to do, you can do it. Um, uh, all of you are smart and, and, and used to learning, so I would, I would encourage you not to be daunted by the fact of, of learning something that's perhaps outside of your major, outside of your field of expertise, because there is a fantastic resource called Google and YouTube uh, in terms of just learning things outside of your core coursework. Another lesson that I've really learned, and this is something that's been instilled by my CEO, um, uh, Alex Dagan, uh, he always asks me what's next, what's going to put us ahead of everyone else and what everyone else is doing in five years time. And I think this is particularly relevant for competitions like this, because this is an opportunity for you to, to dream big and think, what could we do? Rather than, you know, what, what, what can we do with what's already existing? So uh, one of the things that we've been really trying to do is um, in the field cross species Michaelis pose detection, which is a bit of a mouthful, but because what we what we feel we can do with this with this technology is that we can answer those high level questions that people are asking that we when we speak to them, they are interested in things like disease and behavior often what are the, what is what is this animal doing rather than is it here. Now, this is not always true, we recognize that there are there are many questions people ask but by looking forward to what can be done. Uh, in the future, we we can kind of you know stay ahead and get funding for for those kind of more aspirational um, uh, goals as well. What this what these kind of technologies mean is that we can do behavioral clustering. So this is an example of something that we're going to test very very soon with the Smithsonian, and that is clustering behaviors. So this this is an example of a deer rut, which means that the uh, that the uh, well that the male deers are in rut, and that. Uh, is very useful to understand the, uh, the population dynamics uh, in the field. <laughs> Another lesson, and this is maybe not so relevant for today, but that things are always harder than you expect, particularly in conservation, because you don't have, you don't have a pretty data set to work with often. Uh, this is an example I like to show everyone. The one on the left is some of something from our training data. We have fantastic training data often, you know, amazing data that's just collected by a bunch of people. This is a handheld camera of, on a, you know, in, in, of, of an elephant. Algorithms work fantastic with this kind of data, but in reality, what you get a lot of the time is the thing on the right, which is a squirrel on my, on my porch just out here because we've been in, in, in lockdown. I haven't been able to do much field work, but that has terrible backlight. It's got bad contrast but we still need to be able to capture that. Often our images are blurry, they're at night, they have, we have a leaf in front of it. So what I'm trying to say is that designing for the, designing for the field is something that you should all consider um, if, you're, if you're putting something out there. So things aren't perfect, they're not lab, they're not lab conditions. Uh, this is very important. Um, <laughs> a lot of my job, even though I'm an engineer, is talking to people. Uh, we've done for the Sentinel project, uh, right now, this has been going on for nearly a year. We've done nearly 200 interviews um, because what it started off with 
is a very complex solution. We had a camera and a microphone and a FLIR, a, a heat sensing camera that could do a bunch of things. Um, and it's expensive, it's harder to build, it takes longer. Uh, and we don't have the technical expertise on team necessarily to do all of those things at once. And so what I'd really encourage you to do is when you have those discussions with the users, ask them what they want um, and only build what they want <laughs> because that way you're giving them something that they want as quickly as you can. This was also true with the, with the NABIT project whereby we had this, this, this very complex system, this very complex technical system that did everything automated. Um, but the, what, what we found is our users were happy to do one of the manual steps and that made our engineering timeline uh, reduce significantly. And that's allowed us to get the users what they want quicker. Um, I just want to quickly go on to my other uh, kind of venture, I guess, um, which is Fauna Labs. This actually was a project that came out of Duke Conservation Tech. Uh, it is now a incorporated company uh, and we've received funding from uh, Nat Geo uh, and are hoping to, uh, and Duke, we're hoping to raise some more. Um, but this is an example of how you can actually take your idea today and turn it into a company one day. Um, this is kind of, I really hope that I can take this further. It's really exciting. Uh, but essentially what it is, it's a Fitbit for non-humans, so animals. We actually designed this for whales initially. Um, but what we found is that it actually works through mammalian fur. So things like dogs, horses, other mammals. Um, and so it's a non-invasive way of tracking heart rate and the, the physiologic, physiology of these animals. Um, as you can see here, um, this is a signal from my co-founders, Italian Greyhound, um, working through the fur. Uh, your, your Fitbit wouldn't be able to do that or your Apple Watch or whatever, because the, the signal is, will just not get through the, through the system. But uh, it's a very exciting project, but also say this was a collaboration with a PhD student that came out of an, an idea from a very similar idea thon to this. So using the people at your universities is an opportunity to, to really get a cool idea off the ground and maybe even turn it into a business. Um, I hate to say this as someone that loves hardware, but um, hardware is hard and as much as possible, derive your value from things that aren't hardware um, because it's hard and expensive and it's, it takes a long time. Now, I love hardware. I will always do hardware in all my projects because I think it is fantastic to have something tangible. And it's often necessary to get something into the field. Um, but just consider, you know, some of the that we have a lot of data already. And if you're trying to do something and get into the field and get your get your teeth into the field of conservation technology and you have the software background or you have the data data processing background, consider those as well. It doesn't have to be a gizmo or a gadget that goes out in the field to have an impact in conservation. Um, this is why we spent so much time at Fauna Labs trying to get this to work. That green light was the first time we saw our board go live and we spent hundreds, if not thousands of hours trying to get that board to a, to a, to a that green light means all the sensors are working. Um, it is so hard to get that to work, especially if it's your first build. I'm sure that if you have done it many times, it will get easier, but it was very hard for us to, to get to that stage. Um, another lesson for conservation is that <laughs> standard techniques may not apply. Um, we work in a field that <laughs> has some challenges that are unique to it. And so often being a little innovative about even how you build things is, is, is necessary. So you don't have consistent connectivity. You know, we talk about trail cameras all the time. People are like, well, isn't that just a ring doorbell? It is, but it doesn't have Wi-Fi. It doesn't have the capability to do all of those things that you'd expect from modern technology just because of where it is. So considering where you deploy your device and, and the kind of technology or the limitations of where it is, uh, is, is really important. Another thing to note is that it's very harsh on technology to put something out in the field. If you're going in the rainforest, you're talking about often 100% humidity and, and in the Amazon, you know, you get big swings in water level. So is your stuff waterproof and does it work if it's underwater? And then finally, like I mentioned this earlier, um, keeping things low cost is really important in the field of conservation. Uh, I have spoken to many people that um, 
that don't want to necessarily buy something from us because it's too expensive. And that's just unfortunate, but that's just the, the reality of working in this space. So keeping your stuff low cost, keeping it as simple as possible is something that you all should consider with whatever you're, whatever you're talking about uh, doing this weekend. This is a good example of, of a unique challenge we have to face in the field of Marines, in the, in the Marine space. Um, actual device is very small. It's actually tiny, um, about the same size as your, as your standard smartwatch. Um, the problem is things that electronics are uh, more dense than water, which means they, means they sink. So uh, you have to make it float if you want to get the stuff back. And so you, this is an example of, you know, something we have to deal with. This is syntactic foam. It makes things float. But it's an extra uh, extra step that you may not consider if you are uh, trying to design something, um, you know, in the for something that's not in conservation. So just being aware of those limitations um, and speaking to people about, <laughs> about these lessons. I actually just made a tag that didn't float the other day. Um, and that is a, uh, a rather big error um, because that means that if we put it on an animal, it will go to the bottom of the ocean and never be seen again. Um, so just considering all of those little things is often half the challenge. Um, finally, um, it's really hard to scale something. So it's very easy and it's not very easy. It is much easier to make one of something than it is to make multiple of something. You have to deal with stock, you have to deal with tracking your where your where your devices are, what it's working on um, in terms of the platform, those kind of considerations. Um, so make your, make your prototype, make it fast, test it, make sure it works. Um, but then think about very quickly how you will achieve scale because that's how you're gonna achieve impact. I really loved uh, Rainforest Connections a presentation this morning because they spoke about the global network of acoustic devices and they had the platforms to make sure it scaled. Um, and that's really awesome because that's how uh, we really make an impact. Having one of something can only get us so far. So just, just considering that uh, in terms of your solutions about how you could get it to scale, that is uh, not only thinking about inventory and stuff, but also funding. I think that's just something to quickly mention. Um, along those lines, I mentioned this earlier, and, and actually this was something that Eric uh, mentioned as well, finding markets that can offset the costs of your conservation kind of goals may be useful to consider. So there's cross, cross, cross applicable markets that are, are something, to, something worth thinking about. Um, partly because conservation doesn't actually have enough money often to sustain a, a team that uh, that you would like to achieve the goals you want for your for your for your mission. So, like I mentioned, we are at Forna Labs uh, do, doing a device that not only works in whales but also works on things like. Uh, dogs and horses because the veterinary medicine market actually would allow us to scale the business and achieve the conservation impacts even though that these ventures do not necessarily have a conservation impact. I uh, Just final thoughts. Um, this is really important to remember and something that I learned I think the hard way um, just early on. Um, if you're an engineer, um, and this is just true for me, there, there may be domain experts among yourselves, but you're a technical expert, you're not a domain expert, meaning that you don't necessarily understand the problems. So all the conversations you go into or, uh, or asking, um, or you talk to people that are in the field, they're the, they're the people you're designing for. So 90% of the conversation should be listening to them uh, and, and understanding what their needs are rather than what you can offer. Talk about what you can do, but I think that really remembering that any conversation you have is you are serving those people. Uh, and so really learn from them whenever you can. And then finally, um, I it's kind of corny, but you know, whatever. Uh, a rising tide list all boats. Um, there is not enough resources in the conservation space to uh, compete. Uh, my CEO, Alex, uh, talks about uh, the fact that our only ex only competitor is extinction. And this problem is too big to kind of fight among what's the best idea. Uh, and so as much as possible, incorporate 
partner, so incorporate other people's ideas, partner with them, uh, and really start to think about how you can leverage what's being already being done by the scientific community rather than reinventing the wheel. Um, that's all I have. I welcome questions, comments, um, disagreements, whatever, um, and then perhaps any any other comments uh, people have about how this may apply to this uh, this weekend. Oh, sorry, I just saw that my voice was going in and out. Hopefully it wasn't too bad for everyone. Um, <laughs> um, what, are, what are good ways about learning about the domain problem or domain slash problem if you don't have specific clients to talk to? Um, <laughs> I, would, I would say that you, you should be able to find people uh, if, if, you, if you try. Um, now, you, you probably have a broad sense of where, where you want to work. Uh, for us, for example, at, um, at, uh, at Conservation Exercise for the Sentinel project, uh, there are people doing similar stuff or have tried to do similar stuff, but perhaps uh, haven't necessarily got the capabilities we have um, for AI. There are, fan there are many, many people that use cam camera traps, and we just have to find those people in scientific literature, in popular articles, uh, asking around our network. Um, and if anyone needs help, um, asking people like uh, the mentors for connections or myself uh, will always help. Uh, can you give an example of how not being able to scale hindered the progress of a project? Um, I'm not sure I can give an, a specific example. I guess what I really mean by that is that just if we're trying to create impact, uh, it really has to, if you want an impact, you got to have a big, a big presence in some way. Now, th that might mean many, many, uh, many devices that may mean global accessibility. But just considering that, I, I don't necessarily think there's a specific example. I know that um, we had a project at Duke Conservation Tech when I was there, I believe that um, I believe it's still kind of going on uh, where we were trying to do uh, a, a sea turtle deterrent using green LEDs. Um, we have a prototype, but you know that doesn't mean anything if we can't get it out into the field and, and have that on, on on many gill nets to stop that stop that event from happening. So um, really, you know, if it's in the lab, it's not it's not going to be useful. Uh, you know, it has to go into the field and and ideally go into the field as, as or I'm hardware biased, I realize so. Uh, when I talk about the field, you may have a software solution that is accessible to many people as well, so. Seems like Sam is having some technical difficulties. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, continue asking. Oh, maybe his computer died. Um, you can wait for a few minutes to see if he reconnects. This is Josh. I work with Sam at CXL. I'm happy to answer any questions that are coming up. Um, 
I'm not going to answer for Sam on, on any recent <laughs> innovations that maybe inspire him. Um, but I'm going to, I'll try and come up with some, some thoughts on that and come back to that. Uh, where do you try to strike the balance between system simplicity for cost and functionality for use? That's a great question. Um, and we've been doing a lot of, of uh, brainstorming and talking around that at, at CXL recently. The main thing that uh, I've encouraged us to consider really is, is what is going to allow the technology to be adopted. Um, so when we talk about cost, we have the privilege as a nonprofit of considering very much so what that cost is to the end user, less so than we have to think about it in terms of a profit margin. Uh, but at the end of the day, it really comes down to what the market will bear. And so we're looking at optimizing the balance between um, what we can fit into a package that is affordable. So that, that really sets a constraint. And when you look at different markets, you'll see that they can bear different cost structures. They can handle different price points. Um, and so I think that one of, the, one of the ways I'd encourage you to go about that process is setting up the, well, there's Sam again. Uh, setting up the internal tension of, you know, Sam might be more hardware focused than I am. I'm often more business focused than Sam is. And I think that there's a, a healthy benefit that comes from the, the respectful debates that we have around that. Yeah, 100%. Sorry, everyone, I cut out there for a second. Uh, I am now on uh, mobile uh, LTE. So I guess my wife always having some problems. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I agree with that. Um, Sam, there's also a previous question for you asking which recent conservation tech innovations inspire you? <laughs> um, I think I was halfway through answering that. I think that I said that Rainforest Connection is a fantastic example of that, uh, of recent innovations using AI at scale uh, across in, in terms of hardware deployments. Uh, Wild Me is worth looking at. Uh, they are a Portland-based company that does individual re-identification of animals and they've been able to really understand populations uh, because they can uh, track individuals throughout space and time. Um, there are a number, I said there's also some commercial companies like uh, Sail Drone uh, has been a fantastic uh, example of, of someone, uh, of a company that actually raised capital and has a, a very successful startup business. Um, but I'd also say that, you know, some of the really in interesting innovations are happening in adjacent spaces. So spaces that um, may not necessarily be directly mo monitoring wildlife, but they may be uh, addressing problems in the supply chain, um, looking at crime, uh, fighting, you know, wildlife crime or, or similar areas. Um, so, you know, looking at those adjacent spaces that really affect, as we call the underlying drivers are, are, are pretty uh, interesting to think about. So what are the, you know, underlying drivers of, of, uh, of biodiversity loss in the Amazon? You know, you, you're looking at things like forestry, uh, you know, deforestation. So uh, there are a number of, you know, fantastic organizations that monitor that. Um, so uh, forest, uh, it's a forest watch. Um, anyways, but there are a bunch of, of satellite companies that do this kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, so, you know, really, you know, thinking about that, we also have a competition, uh, have a competition, had a, had the first round of a competition and, and have a new competition coming up around its seasonal scale mining, which is a huge problem, especially, um, in the Amazon around, uh, mining of things like gold and tungsten, uh, that go into our phones. Uh, that are really important for, you know, things like uh, electric cars. Uh, and so, you know, recent innovations around lithium free, you know, uh, batteries uh, or cobalt, such as cobalt free batteries are, are really important for biodiversity loss and, 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 uh, and habitat loss in, in rainforests. So just consider those spaces as well. Was there any other questions? Sorry. <laughs> I, th I think just, just, I'll just close. I think if there's no other questions, um, 
Can everyone still hear me? Yeah, okay. Um, that, you know, this is a fantastic time to experiment uh, and think big. Uh, you have not only the opportunity of this weekend to, you know, think of like uh, new, new innovations in the space, but you also have the opportunity by being in college, you know, to, to, do, a, to do something interesting and, and, and do something a little risky because, you know, often schools have funding for to do interesting stuff uh, and be able to continue your project beyond just this weekend. And I think, you know, personally, as someone that, the, you know, I was part of the team that founded Blueprint alongside Josh, uh, we, I think, would be really excited to see some of these go beyond just ideas and really get turn into, turn into innovations. And I think, you know, really, really would love to help any of you throughout that process of, of turning it and turning it turning an idea into something a little more real. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for coming out and for sharing all of this with us. I thought that was a fantastic presentation and workshop and a lot of things that you said um, are things that I've encountered in my at CT, and I'm sure are things that our teams are going to encounter as they're coming up with their projects. Uh, so thank you so much for your time. Um, and for everyone here, Sam is also going to be at the mentor office hours. So if you come up with questions or you want to get more advice about your specific project, uh, come to his office hours. And same with Josh.